Sophia's eighth letter. Dear Yaristan, I don't know how to begin. I can't bring myself to tell you what happened here. I can't even make myself believe it. It's over. Everything is over. The sun we saw on the horizon didn't rise. It's as if everything that happened during the past few weeks was a dream. As if nothing at all had happened. It's worse than that. It's as if we were all dead and had come to life only long enough to dream we were alive. I'm home with Sabina in a world that hasn't changed. We haven't been able to find Tina, Pat, or Tizzy. Ted is in jail. And I can't continue writing this letter because my eyes are so full of tears I can't see. I'm trying again a day later. Your letter has been with us for a week. Sabina and I discussed everything in it several times, but I simply couldn't bring myself to tell you what we've experienced since I last wrote you. I even asked Sabina to write you and to tell you I was too sick to write. She told me she couldn't possibly replace me because your letters are love letters, Sophia. I'd like very much to communicate with Myrna again, but not by letter. So would I, Yarstan, with you and Myrna and Yara and all of you. During the whole past week, I wished I were among you instead of here. I'm afraid Myrna's excursions can no longer include all the areas where human beings live. This area is back to normal. The destruction of limits, the birth of possibilities, are no longer taking place here. People have returned to the laborers that restrict their frontiers and destroy their possibilities. The police arrested hundreds of people at Luis's factory and occupied the plant. At other plants, the union announced a victory and workers returned to their jobs. The police attacked the occupied university. Ted's print shop was attacked by the police when it was being used day and night by hundreds of people. Postal and transportation workers returned to their jobs after their unions announced victories. At one large assembly plant, the union had workers vote on a list of demands before calling off the strike. I had a hard time taking it all in, and I still can't believe so much activity could have been repressed so quickly. I don't have any explanations. I don't want to be the genius who now understands that so many people fail to realize their desires because of one, two, three, bang, the key which happens to be right here in my pocket. I now know that the political strategists who understand why so many people didn't realize their variegated, contradictory, and unpredictable desires, in reality understand nothing except their own miserable desire to lead. A week of discussions with Sabina have convinced me that I don't have any keys. I have less of a right than anyone to make a critique of others' practice. You and Sabina may have fallen into traps. I was never out of a trap. Except for an instant, which I failed to prolong, my only desire has been to be led by the nose. There was never any reason to repress anything I was doing. I've never been free. Free human beings can't be repressed. They have to be destroyed. Sabina and I didn't spend all week discussing me. We mainly talked about your letters. Not only the letter that came a week ago, but also the two Damon had brought to the so-called council office, which seems so unreal now. It was only a week ago that Sabina learned about the strike at Myrna's plant and about your confession. Of course, the first thing I asked her was if she had known you and Louisa had been lovers. Did I know? Yarasan wagged as if he were Louisa's tail. How can Yarasan describe that affair so naively? He was being shaped like dough. Sabina even remembers the day when Titus first brought you to her house soon after the war. Zabrin was as proud as if he were displaying a princess he saved from dragons. And Louisa introduced her new fellow worker to us as someone who'd been a thief and had slept in alleys until Titus recruited him to the resistance organization and transformed him into the most admirable of killers. Louisa wanted him on that very day. A second Nachalo, she told us. Right off the streets. Isn't he beautiful? Louisa was determined to do with Yaristan what she failed to do with Nachalo. She was determined to shape him into a servant of a project that wasn't his own. She tried to make him an organizer, a magnet. But although she put all of her mind as well as her body into her task, she failed miserably. Apparently, he did become something of a magnet to Yasna and some of the others, but the project he carried wasn't Luisa's, it was Jan's. Yarostan could no more be made to serve the organization than Nachalo. Luisa tried to teach him what she tried to teach Nachalo, but thanks to his friendship with Jan, Yarostan didn't learn what she tried to teach Nachalo, but what she'd learned from him. He did become a little bit of a second Nachalo. That's why Louisa abandoned him in the heat of the struggle for a hunk of more flexible dough. I remind her, Yaristan had the impression Louisa succeeded in communicating her political ideas to him. He says he didn't reject Louisa's position until his second prison term. Yaristan also had the impression that Louisa's house embodies Sabina's outlook, she continued sarcastically. He had the impression that all relations were open, nothing was left unsaid, there were no taboos, nothing was forbidden, and while he was having that impression, he was being manipulated shaped into something he was going to hate, a politician. 
a so-called rank-and-file leader. His whole training was underhanded. Nothing was said. Yarstan thinks he treated you as a toy? If so, he learned from her, because he was her toy, and everyone knew except you and he. Yarstan was a hoodlum to her, and he never became anything more. I object to that. You're exaggerating. Louisa didn't share George Albert's prejudices until after we emigrated. She never called anyone a hoodlum until I brought Ron home. The prejudices were already there, Sabina insists, and she didn't get those prejudices from Albert's. It's obvious where Albert's got them. During the war, he had associated with an altogether different class of people from the proletarians and organizers he'd known before. When he returned to his family after the war, he was a successful physicist, and Louisa's friends seemed like so much trash to him. I know Louisa couldn't stomach him. She paraded Yarosan in and out of the bedroom so as to infuriate Albert's. And she knew Albert's would be furious precisely because Yarostan was trash to him. She understood Albert's social tastes because her own were already very similar to his. Louisa was no longer the organizer who had picked Natchelo up in the street. Since that day, she had associated with officers in the popular army, with union functionaries who became government officials. She had moved in circles of eminently respectable people. They were the comrades she had in mind when she spoke of downtrodden proletarians. It was to this level of respectability that she wanted to raise Yarostan. And until she raised him, he was trash to her. But you're right. She didn't express this contempt for her lover directly. She did use the word hoodlum already then, but not to characterize Yarostan. Don't you even remember a fragment of the conversations Le Louisa had with Titus Zebra? Not one fragment, Sabina. That was over twenty years ago. You're the one who is odd for remembering, not I for forgetting. I wouldn't feel bad for having a bad memory, Sophia, but for having to take someone else's word about an event I had experienced. How can you let everything in your head just lie where it falls, without ever moving it around? There's no such thing as a bad memory. You're just lazy. Louisa used the word hoodlum daily. But you're right, she didn't call Yarostan a hoodlum, not directly. She reserved the term for Yarostan's best friend. Every time Zabrin came over, they groaned to each other about Jan Sedlak's deplorable influence on Yarostan, about Jan's total lack of self-discipline, about the incoherence of Jan's political outlook. They called him a lumpen element, a hooligan, a hoodlum, all of which was taboo, forbidden in Louisa's house. They said such horrible things about Jan that I couldn't wait to meet him. I didn't get my chance until the first day of the strike. On that day, I watched their protege, Yarostan, mess up all their plans. I didn't understand the politics then. I still don't. But I knew from Zabron and Luis's faces that something had fallen apart for them. And during the day, I learned that it was their Pygmalion, Yarostan. Actually, the scheme was simple enough, and I think I understood it even then. In theory, the workers were supposed to be seizing power over the productive forces. But in practice, as Yarostan told us in his second letter, the workers' organization was going to replace the capitalist class as the manager of production. Workers were supposed to experience this feat as their victory, the way they did here last week. The task of Yarostan, the rank-and-file militant, was to pretend he desired such a victory, and to parade the desire in front of the other workers who didn't yet know this was what all workers wanted. The deepest layers of the proletariat itself had to be the ones who defined the historical tasks of the proletariat. But Yarostan sat and daydreamed. Luisa and Zebran, at the risk of being called manipulators, had to define the historical tasks. Vera and Mark immediately backed them up, but then Jan threw his wrench into their apparatus. He started shouting that the workers' real struggle wouldn't begin until workers tore down the factories, dismantled the machines, and burned the productive forces. I shouted, bravo! Yasna applauded, and Yarostan laughed. Louisa and Zebron were furious. Why were you so enthusiastic about what Jan said, I asked her. That enthusiasm seems to conflict with your whole life's commitment. Yarostan referred to that contradiction in his newest letter. Because I was in a schizophrenic already then, Sabina exclaimed. Or maybe that was when my schizophrenia began. I applauded because Jan had thrown a wrench into Luisa's and Zabron's machinery, and also because what he said made a lot of sense to me, and still does. I even understood some of the implications of what he said. During the days that followed, he told me that as a boy he had lived among streams, forests, and fields, and I'd love to explore their secrets. Ever since he'd become a worker, he'd been reduced to an appendage of a machine. He told me if revolution and freedom meant anything, they certainly couldn't mean a struggle for the freedom to stand at the very same machine every living day. To Jan, revolution meant a new start. It meant taking up again where he'd left off in his boyhood. I thought I agreed with him, but I didn't understand his position as a rejection of technology. I combined Albert's position with Jan's and got what I thought was a perfect synthesis. What I had in mind was the dispersal of the technology in the forests and fields and I thought people would relate to it the same way they related to the trees and the streams, not for mutilation and enslavement, but for adventure, 
exploration, travel, and enjoyment. My synthesis was overstretched. It didn't work. But I didn't find that out until last week. In the carton plan, I wasn't even aware of a contradiction, and in my guts I supported every stand Jan took. I suppose you don't remember the discussion of the slogans, either. That took place on the second day of the strike. I didn't understand the political significance of the discussion, but I helped Jan mess up the united front Louisa and Zabrin had looked forward to. The carton plant was to contribute to the general effort by printing slogans on posters which were to be used in demonstrations. Louisa and Zabrin had minor disagreements about the slogans that should go on the posters. Suddenly Jan objected to the very idea of demonstrations with posters. He said we should talk to our fellow workers with our mouths, not with posters blocking us from each other. I caught on right away and asked what our discussions would be like if each of us sat behind a placard with a slogan on it, and if we waited for the placards to talk to each other. That's when everything went haywire. Yarstan was supposed to guide the group back to task at hand, but he only nodded at Jan's and my comments. The United Front fell apart. Yasna considered Jan's comments as reasonable as Louisa's. Zabrin and Louisa were almost isolated. Only Claude Tamnik and Mark Glavny stood by them. Even Vera Nice vacillated. Yasna was right about Vera. She was an opportunist. She became Louisa's disciple because she wanted to be what Yaristan was supposed to have become, the tribune, the rank-and-file leader. But as soon as Louisa was isolated, Vera abandoned her, and of course she took Adrian, her flunky, with her. You make them all sound so petty and manipulative. Are you sure you're not describing Vera in the light of what Yaristan told us she became much later? I asked Sabina. I'm still trying to defend the integrity of my original community. I'm describing them in the light of what they did, Sophia, she insists. In fact, what Vera did later doesn't even make a whole lot of sense to me. Her antics with that husband and lover don't quite fit with the Vera I knew 20 years ago. I might as well tell you about my experience with Vera Nice. You figure out how it fits with what she became later. She didn't switch sides only because Louisa was isolated, but also because of me. You mean you convinced her Jan was right? You could put it that way, but I didn't convince her with words. Vera couldn't stand Jan, and she'd never have switched sides if I hadn't been there. It was my presence that convinced her. The first time I spoke, she took me aside and told me, What a witty, intelligent, fiery girl you are. She couldn't believe I was only 13. You're a siren, she told me, pretending to be a gypsy girl. That was what convinced her. I didn't know it right then, but she was courting me as openly as the circumstances and her own inhibitions would allow. She found the same treasure behind the long black hair that Zabron had found in Yaristan, a gem buried in sand. I sensed her passion was excited by it without understanding it. I played with it. I sat by her, whispered in her ear, laughed with her, touched her. I wasn't aware that the pale, pretty woman whose chest heaved and whose face grew red whenever I touched her wanted to fling me to the floor then and there, in the midst of the meeting. I didn't know what a fire I was stirring up in her whenever I whispered to her. Until then, I had played in the park behind the school and had taken friends home with me, but I had never had contact with pure lust, with blind desire. It was only on the following day, the third day of the strike, that I realized what was happening. Zabron opened that day's meeting by groaning about the fact that nothing had gotten done during the first two days of the strike. Then he said, The presence of outsiders who were not production workers, disruptive, individualistic elements, was responsible for this. Vera knew he was referring to my presence. She slipped her hand over my fist, as if to let me know she'd keep me from being thrown out. Gradually, she tightened her hold, dug her fingernails into the palm of my hand. I could see her eyes were red from lack of sleep. Her teeth bit her lips. I whispered that she was hurting me, but her grip only tightened. I became afraid of something I didn't then understand. I was about to be overpowered and maybe even destroyed by something I couldn't control or restrain. Vera was driven by a blind desire to dominate me, to own me, to enslave me, without any trace of love or mutuality or equality. Gosh, Sabina, I never imagined. I don't think anyone else did either, Sophia, because nothing actually happened. It was Yaristan who saved me from being ravaged by Vera, and also from being thrown out by Zabron. Yaristan dreamily proposed an action somewhere between printing posters and destroying machines. He too was good at making syntheses between diametrical opposites. When Zabron brought up the presence of outsiders, Yaristan brought up the presence of the owner, Mr. Zagad. Yaristan is excessively modest. It's true that Claude made the action concrete by suggesting Zagad be ousted, but that suggestion was nothing but the logical step that followed from Yaristan's observation. Jan jumped up, ready to implement the suggestion on the spot, and I leaped out of the fire at it, unintentionally fed, and threw my arms around Jan and Yarostan. The whole plan was Yarostan. That was what I thought, too, but Yarostan wrote that Claude didn't only make his suggestion concrete, but was also the one who finally implemented it. Yarostan is wrong, Sabina says emphatically. 
Today he'd like to make himself believe he didn't have anything to do with those events. Claude added nothing but his usual contributions. We should oust the god with clubs and guns, like the police would do it. Yarastan asked why we couldn't just ask the god to leave. And in the end, it was Claude who implemented Yarastan's strategy. We went peacefully to Sagad's office, and Claude asked him to leave. That event was important to me. I thought it was the beginning of Yan's revolution. I thought the first step would be followed by others. Workers would start tearing down factory walls and pushing machines into fields and forests. I was overjoyed when Zagad left his office. I threw my arms around Yan, and he asked me to spend the night with him. That was when my revolution began. Yan was the only man I gave myself to completely. He was my twin. He rejected all constraints. He was open to every conceivable experience. He refused to be stunted. He was Margarita Nachalo in the shape of a man. Why did Jan take you to Yaristan's room instead of his own? I asked her. Yaristan said they exchanged keys. Yaristan started that letter by telling you how honest and complete he was going to be. He's a hypocrite. He still doesn't approve of his best friend's morals. Maybe he doesn't want men to know. I think she'd be flattered. I asked Jan the same question, and he told me he didn't want to take me to his room because he shared his bed with his sister. You mean Myrna lived in his room, I ask? That was what I thought, Sabina goes on. I was fascinated beyond words. He told me his sister was two years younger than I was. He was surprised I wasn't shocked, but my whole body filled with curiosity. I longed to meet the eleven-year-old girl who shared her bed with her brother. I insisted on going to his room instead of Yaristan's. I flew into a rage when he refused to take me there. He told me his sister was wildly jealous and would scratch my eyes out, but that only aroused my curiosity all the more. I threatened to leave him if he didn't take me to her, so finally he told me the girl in his room was his sister only in age. He told me he did love his real sister, but had been separated from her by a religious vampire who had policed their love. The girl in his room was a homeless urchin. She had run to Yan in the street and begged him to hide her from the police, who were chasing her for stealing. He had hidden her, and she had stayed on with him. He considered her his make-believe sister. Yaristan was apparently shocked. I stopped insisting on going to Yan's room, but I couldn't stop being fascinated by his real sister. I asked him her name, what she looked like, and what she had done with her brother under the very nose of morality of the church. When he pulled me to bed, I refused to undress until he agreed to pretend to be his sister and to show me how his sister made love to her brother. Jan agreed. Myrna underestimates him. He was full of pranks. For Jan, liberated life was going to be a game, a love game, played intensely, with every limb and pore. He agreed to be Myrna for me, and while he performed, I made love to the sister he was pretending to be. I fell in love with her. I lost myself in an ecstasy matched by only one other experience in my life, the following night's experience with the real Myrna. Jan's enjoyment was as great as mine. He continually told me, all life should consist of moments like these, interrupted only by periods of rest. It was out of gratitude that early the following morning, he told me he'd take me to meet his sister that very day. But first we had to think of a way of getting the religious mother out of the house. Jan knew I had fallen in love, not with him, but with his sister. And he understood my passion. He fanned it. He loved me for it. The guardians of the social order had to kill Jan. There was no way for them and him to coexist. In his heart, Jan carried the dissolution of every order. He'd always break through it with acts of passion unimaginable until then. Yarstan returned to his room at daybreak. He obviously hadn't slipped a wink. He didn't describe his night with Jan's roommate. We didn't ask. His night hadn't been a happy one. He seemed absolutely worn out, miserable, lonely, perhaps ashamed. Both of us knew he was pining for Louisa. Myrna is wrong about the plot to seduce the queen of the peasants. It was Jan's idea from beginning to end. As soon as Yaristan knocked at sunrise, Jan knew what to do with the old vampire. If only Yaristan would resume with Jan's mother where he left off with Louisa, Myrna would be free and Jan and I would up to each other courting her without any rules or time limits, without any standards of right and wrong. The revolution would begin when all of us started doing what we pleased. But Yaristan didn't want to contribute any more to our plan than he contributed to Zabrin and Louisa's. We barely succeeded in getting him to go with us. As soon as he saw the queen, the object of his passion, he yawned. Next time he saw her, he vomited. He spent the entire afternoon and night sound asleep. We might as well have thrown a dead animal at the old woman. Would you like him better if he'd become your tool? No, Sophia, I would have liked him less. And in any case, it wasn't my fun he spoiled at yawns. The old woman concentrated all her energy on keeping Jan out of the game, with fabulous results. Those results were summarized for us by the untouched virgin herself twenty years later. I suspect the old woman even had an inkling of why Jan had brought Yaristan. Her endless crosses and wails and prayers suggested she had trouble keeping the thought from passing through her own mind. The devil must have tried to slip into her consciousness while the rest of us were out picking berries. 
What she didn't have any inkling about was the infinity of forms the devil could take. That night she thought the devils were all safely put away in Jan's bedroom at the other end of the house. She expected to hear the first step the devil took toward the room containing the two chaste virgins. Meanwhile, all her worst fears were being acted out by the virgins themselves, unaided by any visiting demons. In one of their discussions, Myrna told Yaristan she thought you hadn't been honest with her, I remind her. I know, and she hurt me by saying that. She didn't describe to Yaristan the game we actually played. She transformed it, and I can't understand why. Is she ashamed of the role she played? I doubt it. Myrna had no shame, not, not then. You're twins in that respect, aren't you? More than twins, Sophia. We're permanently embedded in each other's hearts. That's why I was hurt when Myrna inverted a key detail and made me seem so manipulative. Don't look at me so strangely, Sophia. Don't forget, I wasn't 32 then. Myrna and I were only two years apart, and I didn't play the dominant role. The seduction was as mutual as the most reciprocal love depicted in any poetry. The mutuality of our love condemned the ugliness of all the brutalizing one-sided relationships in the midst of which it all took place, and first of all, Louisa's relationship to Yaristan, which was nothing but sheer manipulation. Next, Yaristan's relationship with you, Vera's toward Adrian and me, Zabrin's toward Yaristan, Albert's toward Louisa, and finally Yasna's pathetic and unrecognized desire for Zabrin and Yaristan. Our love had nothing in common with any of those. It had no blemishes. The detail Myrna changed is precisely what made that night so incomparably beautiful, so unique in my whole life's experience. Well, what did she change? I asked impatiently. She was angry at you for pretending to be her brother and rousing her passion for your own selfish gratification. Don't tell me you did it for her. I know you too well. I'm not denying my selfishness, Sophia, nor Myrna's. She's right about why I did it, but she's wrong about what I did. I didn't pretend to be young that night. I'm disappointed that Myrna forgot that. It was a rare, unforgettable night. Moonlight streamed in through the window. It was quieter in that country house than anywhere I'd been before. Myrna asked me if I was Yaristan's girl or Jan's. I remember Jan's telling me she'd scratch my eyes out from jealousy, and I tried to provoke that jealousy. I told her Jan and I were passionately in love with each other, that our love knew no bounds. But that had been Jan's inversion. There was no jealousy in Myrna. She put her hand on my face and told me, if I were Jan, I'd love you passionately without bounds. You're beautiful. I almost cried. I told her, Jan says he loves me only because I remind him of the one person he really loves in the whole world. Myrna insisted I tell her that person's name. I told her. He didn't love me at all until he taught me to act like her and be like her, because he doesn't really love me at all. He only loves her, and her name is Myrna. She was quiet for a long time. I reached for her face and felt tears running down her cheeks. I asked if I had offended her. Then she asked me, did he show you how he spends his night with Myrna, how he slept with her? I told her he showed me everything. She said, this was the bed in which he slept with Myrna until mother made him leave. She sobbed and kissed my hand, telling me, I still cry sometimes when I remember. I was so happy every night, and I was happy during the day because I waited for night to come. Why did Myrna invert what had happened next when she told Yaristan about it? I did not ask her, would you like me to pretend to be Jan? How terribly banal and how manipulative. Yet she works herself into a fury twenty years later, indignant at the creature she's invented during the intervening years. The fact is that my initiative ended with my telling her Jan loved her. From that point on, the initiative was hers, and it remained hers until the end of that glorious night. It was Myrna who asked me, show me what Jan showed you. Please be Myrna for me, just for an instant. I agreed to be Myrna. I lay quietly next to her. Our sides touched. She said, first Jan took Myrna's hand to his lips and whispered, I love you, my little sister, more than I'll ever love anyone else in the whole wide world. That was how it began. And it was Myrna herself who went on, step by step, to an ecstatic climax, slowly uncovering every inch of one body and matching it with every inch of the other, ever so carefully, ever so gently, ever so passionately. Every motion, every gesture, every position she had ever dreamed of taking with Jan, she took with me. Every caress, every embrace, every kiss she had ever dreamed of receiving from her brother, she gave to me. And all that time you pretended to be Myrna? It was the easiest thing in the world to pretend to be Myrna, and to accept all the love and passion she wanted Jan to give her. That was what made that night so incomparable, so monumental to me. And you should have seen her mother's face the next morning when she found her virgin sleeping in the devil's arms. Tissy told me what you looked like when you woke up in her embrace. Your look must have been compassionate compared to that woman's. All her life's pent-up desire, inverted into hatred, was concentrated in her look. She immediately rushed for the broom. Yaristan remembered the rest of it vividly enough. The rest is hardly worth remembering. 
Nothing else happened during the next two weeks. After the old woman chased us away, we went back to the carton plant. I kept expecting next steps to be taken, but there weren't any. After those stupid discussions about slogans on posters, everyone except Jan went back to work to print those posters. Jan and I boycotted the work as well as the rest of the meetings. We wandered throughout the city, among crowds, into factories, among students. We kept looking for those who were taking the next step. And we discovered what Yarasan described to you in his second letter. A vast puppet show. Thousands of mannequins acting on orders pretending to be acting on their own. We did find a few free spirits, but they were isolated, disoriented, and frustrated. Jan knew it was all going to end very badly. It was all too repetitious, too serious, and Jan knew that a revolution couldn't be serious. So at least the two of us stopped being serious. We played at revolution. We played at being free. We challenged, provoked, and sabotaged. But no one responded. We might as well have been alone. I remind her, in the research center, you continue to expect everything to happen. How could you have known during those events 20 years ago that nothing else was going to happen? I'm not sure I can explain that, Sophia. Maybe for the same reason that I've tried to realize contradictory projects. I'm half Natural and half Alberts. 20 years ago, my two halves told me the same thing. Two weeks ago, they told me opposite things. I don't understand, I tell her. I know you were in the midst of a contradiction in the research center. Yaristan saw that right away, and you yourself were aware of it. But I don't see why you were so single-minded 20 years ago. What did your Albert's half tell you then? It wasn't my Albert's half, Sophia, but Albert's himself, in person, who told me exactly the same thing Jan told me. Jan knew right away that all the strike activity was staged and had no other aim but to replace one set of rulers with another. Albert said almost the same thing to me a week before we were arrested. He told me we were going to emigrate as soon as he got all the papers and other arrangements in order. If we didn't emigrate, we'd spend years in jail, maybe even the rest of our lives. I was indignant at first. I wanted Jan and Myrna and all the others to go with us. He told me it wasn't for the whole group that would be jailed, but only the foreigners. He said foreigners were being used as scapegoats to explain why there was opposition to the revolutionary apparatus, so-called. It's so easy to single out foreigners. I told Jan what Alberts had told me, and he said he was relieved to learn we would be allowed to emigrate. He had started to worry when he had heard the rumors that were being circulated about Louisa. He didn't even imagine he would be arrested, too, and didn't dream of emigrating. He had no reason to. Alberts made it all very attractive to me by promising me a whole world of technology as my plaything. He even told me he'd build me a laboratory. Jan and I knew our friendship would end as suddenly as it began. At least we had pretended a revolution was taking place. Then you don't know why the others were in prison for such a long time, I ask her? I haven't the slightest idea, Sophia. Yaristan keeps asking why the three of us were released after spending only two days in jail. That's not what surprises me. I had known we were going to be allowed to emigrate. What surprises me is what happened to the others. No one, not even Alberts, imagined that the isolation of scapegoats would be carried to the point of imprisoning the entire production crew of the carton plant. I didn't have a hint of that fact until Yaristan's first letter came, and I don't understand it. What happened was exactly what Alberts had made me think would happen. I had no reason to be suspicious. We were all arrested. We spent two days in jail. We were released, and the police apologized for their mistake. Louisa and Albert's friend Zabrin was there at the party. Stenek's claim that Zabrin was in jail at the time is puzzling. Stenek must have had another period in mind when he told him that, or another man. I knew who Zabrin was, and the man who saw us off was Titus Zabrin. He had been arrested, too, but only for a day. He told us the entire crew had been arrested by mistake. I thought that apparently someone in the police thought the entire crew were foreigners. Yaristan keeps pointing out how bizarre it is that the Albert's ring were released while the so-called accomplices of the rings were left in jail. It certainly is bizarre, but that wasn't the impression I had at the time. Zabrin, not the Albert's ring, was released first, a day before us, and I was sure the others had been released too. In any case, we weren't given a grand opportunity to find out what had happened to the others. The police accompanied the celebrated physicist and his family to our house, waited while we packed, and escorted us to the train station for the first train out. During the past week, Sabina answered several other questions you raised in your newest letter, as well as the two letters that arrived when she was in the research center. And in answering your questions, she completely demolished the original community I had glorified in my first letters to you. If I still retain some illusions after you tried to knock them out of me, Sabina has finally convinced me that no such community ever existed. In the process of convincing me, she made me doubt the reality of my most recent experiences as well. Were the commune and the council office hallucinations? Did I invent them? Were they dreams on which I can base another lifetime's hopes? If I correspond with Pat 20 years from now, will he write me that the events I remembered ever happened? 
As you can see, I'm not too eager to tell you how I happen to be home discussing your letters with Sabina. I don't even want to think about it. Sabina's right. I'd rather let everything in my head just lie where it fell, without moving around. I may later have to take someone else's word about what happened, but at least I'll have spared myself the pain of living through a horrid experience more than once. I'll try to relive it. I was going to say for your sake, but I can't imagine what good it'll do for you to know. I really do wish Sabina had written you. All I feel like telling you are things she told me. I was slightly drunk, comfortably exhausted, and very happy when I finished my previous letter to you. The day before, with Pat's grudging help, I had given Louisa and Damon a tour of the continent I had discovered that day. I slept soundly for at least twelve hours after I finished that letter, got up at noon, and attacked Louisa's refrigerator. She had returned and left again while I had been asleep. I sealed the letter and walked across the border with it. It was a gorgeous summer day. I let my hair blow in the wind, and I experienced myself as a heroine. I felt victorious. I would realized one of my life's few, maybe only two, independent projects. I had projected it and carried it through all by myself. I felt that I had last come of age to take part in a real revolution. I was still in that mood when I walked to the commune. I was eager to learn what other strikes had broken out, where else the movement had spread. When I reached the entrance of the former university building, two tough-looking young men tried to stop me from going in. Who are you? I asked them. Security, one of them answered. Who the hell put you there? I asked. The answer was, the building is full of informers and spies. Well, go join the police force if you're interested in informers and spies, I shouted, pushing my way past them. The council office was almost the same as I'd left it three days earlier. If I hadn't just run into the security guards, I wouldn't have noticed the difference as quickly as I did. Most of the stacks of pamphlets and leaflets were the same, but there were a few new stacks of leaflets, and these were very distinct from everything else in the room. They were the diatribes of political sects. None of the people in the room were familiar to me. As I listened to their arguments, I became aware that they were all politicians with esoteric axes to grind. I was shocked. I ran upstairs and downstairs looking for familiar faces, for Pat, for workers who had visited the council office, for people I had met at the office machine plant. But all I saw was the hostile, suspicious faces of dedicated professional radicals. The mood in which I had walked across the bridge was gone. I ran to the print shop. It was full of people who were strangers to me, almost all of them men. Suspicious glances followed me as I walked around and looked at the things being printed. All of it looked drab, repetitious, and terribly repressive. Must not and should not appeared in every sentence. In the garbage bin, I found a crumpled leaflet, colorful, well laid out and illustrated, satirizing the self-elected police hysterically trying to recuperate the revolutionary struggle. I suppose that leaflet had been done by Pat's group. I saw no other evidence of the presence of Pat's group in the print shop. I went up the back staircase and knocked on the door, but Ted wasn't there. None of the people in the print shop had ever heard of Tina. Wherever I had left friends, I found only strangers. Wherever I had left a community with a project, I found only hostile politicians. I was in a daze. I dragged myself out of the print shop and drifted across the campus, looking for my lifelong companion and guide, Yaristan, in all his varied forms. I wanted him to take my hand again and show me what had to be done next. I was me again. I did find a guide. Someone handed me a leaflet announcing a militant demonstration against the occupation of an assembly plant by the police. I wondered if it was Louise's plant. I went to the gathering place two hours before the scheduled beginning of the demonstration. Other drifters like myself joined me. Finally, an authority arrived, someone wearing an armband and obviously a member of a political group. After listening to several minutes of his rigid rhetoric, I learned that it was, in fact, Luis's plant that had been occupied by the police. On the previous day, members of various political groups had joined the union picket line. I wondered if they had felt threatened by competition from Damon and had run to sell their political commodities at a lower price. A fight had broken out between union picketers and so-called subversive outsiders. Then a rumor was spread, apparently by union bureaucrats, that subversive saboteurs had seized the plant. This had been an ample pretext for the police to occupy the plant. And right after the police occupied it, the union called on workers to defend their plant from the police. In other words, after calling in the police, the union bureaucrats pretended to be the greatest opponents of the police. The leaflet quoted a union bureaucrat saying, The government is in fomenting disorder and is being helped by groups of revolutionists, adventurists, and punks. From the armbanded leader of the demonstration, I also learned that the purpose of the militant demonstration was to offer solidarity to the fighting workers by joining them in the struggle to oust the police from their plan. I obviously couldn't have gotten him to explain to me in what sense the plant was their plan, nor why the workers would want to go back into it. It didn't occur to me to suggest that everyone might be a lot happier if the police were left inside the plant 
and everyone else went off to do other things. I joined the struggle, and I was extremely nervous. The only other time I took part in a militant demonstration in which I knew I was going to be physically injured was six years ago, when I sat in the street to block trucks carrying weapons. But the struggle at Luisa's plant was more in tune with my upbringing than the peace demonstration had been. I imagine that Luisa and Damon might be behind barricades. I've always thought of her earlier barricades with nostalgia. I've always wanted to have barricades in my own life. I also wanted to get away from the loved places that had suddenly become so alien to me. Several hundred people gathered. It was announced that the demonstrators were to break up into groups of six and to ride into the plant in cars. I found a group of five students with a car and clung to them. For once in my life, I was the least hysterical member of the group. They were completely paranoid. During the entire trip, they talked about police and even army units surrounding the plant with machine guns and even tanks. I told them I doubted that war had been declared, but my own fears increased considerably. Several days later, I learned that their paranoia had been grounded in solid reality. If I had known that at the time, I would have collapsed long before reaching Luis's plan. It turned out that I was the only one of the six who knew the way to the plan, and since I had only been there once, I got lost. I did manage to get them to the right part of the city. They insisted on parking their car miles away from the plant. After walking for what seemed like hours, and after asking several people where it was, we reached a fence inside of which there was an immense parking lot. We decided we had approached the plant from the rear. So much the better, we thought. The police wouldn't be expecting us to come from that direction. We helped each other climb over the fence. We were inside the plant. Before we had a chance to congratulate each other about that fact, we saw two buses rushing toward us. We didn't have the time to climb back over the fence, and there was no place to hide. We were on a completely empty parking lot. Both buses were full of police, all of them armed to the teeth. I don't have the words to tell you how terrified I was. Before they got out of their buses, they threw a canister of gas at us. Then they came out of the buses wearing masks and pointing their rifles at us, and they kept coming out of those buses. Now that I'm putting it on paper, that whole scene seems so ludicrous. Three studious-looking, clean-shaven young men, two girls who hardly looked older than high school students, and I, who couldn't have managed a slingshot between us. Yet there we were, being beaten up at by at least a hundred masked policemen, all armed with rifles and clubs. None of us offered the slightest resistance. The sight of those two buses had killed every trace of rebellion in all of us. Yet the police continued beating us. Finally, they separated us into groups of three and carried us into the buses. The fright was infinitely worse than all the blows I received. Inside the bus, the police spoke of us as if we were foreigners, even as if we had come here from another planet. I had no idea where the bus was taking us, but I had yet another fright when the bus stopped in an empty lot that looked like a garbage dump. We were pushed out of the bus. I was sure we were going to be shot and abandoned in the dump, but we were transferred to the back of a regular police wagon. Apparently, the counterinsurgent police in the buses had to go back to the plant to hunt down more guerrillas. I was trembling and nauseated when the police wagon finally stopped. I didn't know what part of the world I was in when I was ordered to get out. I vomited as soon as I reached the ground. The six of us were pushed into a waiting room lit by one of those eternally bare bulbs. I was sick from the beatings. My lungs felt hollow from the gas. I thought my insides had been injured. I had felt that way every single day when I'd worked in the fiberglass factory. I was fingerprinted. I had to give my name repeatedly. And then, while I was being marched through a hallway with my five companions, I saw another group of gorillas arriving, and Louisa was among them. I smiled weakly to her, but she glared at me with unforgiving hostility. The scene I had made with Pat had spoiled her love affair with Damon. This time I didn't try to call Sabina or Damon to try to get me out of jail. I remember what Myrna had said about our running out on the rest of you, and I was determined to practice solidarity with my combative comrades. But I was in for a big surprise. It happened during my second day in jail. I was told that my lawyer wanted to talk to me. I was escorted to a furnished room, and there I recognized Minnie Vach. Minnie, the college friend with whom I had tried to expose the militarization of the university, with whom I had almost been arrested for littering public property with copies of omissions. As soon as the guard was gone, I threw my arms around her as if I were embracing my best friend. How in the world did you get in as my lawyer? I asked her. Minnie quickly told me that she was, in fact, a lawyer. She works with a group of lawyers who she referred to as Radical Lawyers Collective. Damon had called her. She told me we'd have time to talk after the trial. She was in a hurry to explain her strategy to me. She told me I was to pretend that I was nothing more than an innocent bystander. But they arrested me inside the plant, I reminded her. It doesn't matter, she told me. You were doing research on the student movement. You're Professor Hesper's assistant. Where you choose to do your field work is none of their business. I was intensely disappointed. I regretted having embraced her so warmly. I told her I couldn't go through with her strategy. I didn't want to run out on comrades one more time. I had done that often enough. Suit yourself, Sophie, she told me. 
But you should know that all your co-defendants are getting lawyers, and not free ones either. They've all got parents who can afford the best that money can buy. Anyway, I'll be at your trial. I was terribly depressed during my last days in jail. Everything I lived for seemed to have collapsed. In one of your letters, you had told me that my world of journalistic friends consisted of people who aspired to roles within the ruling bureaucracy. I had indignantly denied that. At the time, I had thought Professor Damon Hesper was the only one who really fitted your description. I could never have imagined Minnie as a lawyer. When I knew her on the newspaper staff, I couldn't have imagined she would compromise everything she stood for to the point of joining the profession that practices the law. Inside that prison, I could understand perfectly what Sabina told me later about Luisa's change of social tastes. While I lay inside my jail cell, Minnie was treated as an equal by prison authorities who regarded me as nothing but so much trash. Of course, in retrospect, I can see that Minnie wasn't as uncompromising as I would have liked to think her, but it's always easy to see such things in retrospect. I remember the day when omissions was launched, and Rhea, Minnie, and I were excluded from it. Minnie was the angriest of the three. She slapped Damon so hard I thought she made a permanent mark on his face. Yet only a few days later, she compromised her solidarity with the other two excluded women and joined the omissions group. But that's still a far cry from joining the legal profession. Of all the people on the newspaper staff, Minnie had been the most opposed to the idea of working within the system to accomplish anything significant. She had been the very antithesis of the managing editor, Bess. But as I lay in my cell thinking about Minnie's compromises, I couldn't keep myself from remembering my own. At the time when you wrote me about my university friend's opportunism, I wasn't lying in a jail cell. I was teaching a university-level course. I was a member of the academic community, not because of conviction or ambition, but because I had drifted there. I thought maybe Minnie had done no more to reach her present situation. I drifted back into the academic world when I learned how Jose had died. When Sabina told me Jose had been picked up in the street like a dead dog, I couldn't do anything but drift. Learning that he had died trying to become someone I could admire sent a terrible shock through me. I fell into Sabina's arms like a baby. I cried hysterically that I wasn't anyone to admire. I had nothing to give Jose because I had become nothing. I was completely alone again. If Sabina hadn't helped me through that crisis, I think I would have disintegrated altogether and permanently. After my miserable experience with art and the peace movement, Jose had become my whole life. I dated my life in terms of his release, simultaneously looking forward to it and fearing it, and at no time feeling able to face it. Jose's release was going to be the test of my capacities. His death put an end to all my prospects. I think it's only the fact that Sabina felt as devastated as I that kept me going during the first weeks after we learned Jose was dead. I had never seen her cry before. I had thought those black eyes that perpetually sparkled with mischief or the desire for adventure were incapable of tears. When I saw tears under those long black eyelashes, I felt an emotion I can't describe with words like friendship and love. Sabina hadn't ever been Jose's girl. She had never shared his bed. She had never desired him physically, yet she loved him. I understood her love for him only because I thought it must be similar to what I felt towards Sabina when I saw her tears. We propped each other up. We talked to each other as we had only once before, during one of my first days in the garage. We didn't talk about Jose or about the past, but only about ourselves. Sabina fought against my self-rejection by telling me we were perfectly matched friends. Our personalities were each other's perfect complements. My lack of self-assurance was a counterweight to her blind self-confidence. My constant self-evaluations were a counterweight to her uncritical acceptance of herself. I tried to tell her she had far less reason to be self-critical than I did. She knew five languages, was as well-versed in all the sciences as most academics I had met, had seen half the world, had experienced every imaginable form of human relationship, had launched projects and grown with them. She had in some sense achieved the full fullness of life. But she told me she had never done what I did all the time. She had never examined the meaning of all her life accomplishments. It was during those weeks that Sabina launched the project in which she's still engaged. She began a systematic evaluation of the key events of her life. And being Sabina, she threw herself into that project with the same single-mindedness and determination with which she did everything she set out to do. I, on the other hand, set out with my usual lack of self-assurance and determination. I got over my shock, but I continued to drift. We remained each other's compliments. I wandered through familiar and unfamiliar neighborhoods. I wandered in and out of bookstores. I wandered to the university campus and found myself reading the catalog of university courses. And while wandering through the catalog, I found Damon Hesper's name listed as the instructor of a course on political philosophy. I couldn't imagine Damon philosophizing on his own. The last time I had seen him, he had only been able to parrot his political group's philosophy, and then only with Minnie's help. 
I think it was curiosity that drove me to enroll in Damon's course. Once I enrolled in his course, I added the other courses I needed to complete my requirements for the bachelor's degree. And once I was a student again, I convinced myself that something I had always wanted existed, at least an embryo, among that generation of students, something like a radical community. I started to look forward to activities which I thought would be similar to those I experienced in the carton plant. I thought I'd find friends with significant projects. I had prospects again. The gap left by Jose's death started to be filled. This was three years ago. The student movement was just starting to take on the characteristics of a generalized movement, the characteristics which three years later made possible the complete occupation of the university and the formation of the commune. I was in the presence of something I hadn't experienced since my immigration. Everything had changed since the day when a tiny group of radicals published a school newspaper in the midst of an almost unanimously hostile student population. 